Can you hear me? Yes, yep. of course. Thank you very much, Paisan, and thank you very much for inviting the APBRS to uh, join with you uh, today. Very special day. I'm going to talk today about submacular hemorrhage and polypodal uh, vasculopathy. And very few conditions can lead to massive hemorrhage. And this is what I'm going to focus on today. So in that case, it's had a, uh, a massive hemorrhage. We can see here that uh, uh, with ICG, we can identify polyps as the cause of this. Subretinal bleeding causes a devastating and permanent loss of sight through various mechanisms, mechanical traction, iron toxicity, and impairing diffusion of nutrients. It also leads to long-term damage through subretinal fibrosis and scarring. We have a number of tools for treating subretinal hemorrhage, gas, TPA, vitrectomy, anti-VEGF, and we've heard a little bit about this today, and also thermal MPDT laser. And the options depend on the vision of the patient, their ability to posture and cooperate with postoperative uh, instructions, as well as the extent and location of the blood. Let me first talk about intravitreal gas displacement. And this was first proposed by Wilson Herriot from Australia in 1996. Uh, there was some concern following this about potential uh, retinal toxicity. Um, and Matt Oji then explored the options of intravitreal gas injection without TPA. Uh, then there was a concern that TPA may not pass through into the subretinal space when given intravitreally. And uh, our American colleagues and also Dr. Shiraga in uh, Japan explored options of subretinal TPA injection. And then um, we've also heard today about adding anti-VEGF uh, to uh, the TPA gas, which potentially can increase uh, our outcomes. This is a 50 year old Indonesian female who presented to me with acute loss of sight. We can see here a large subretinal hemorrhage. And we gave her an intravitreal SF6 injection, 100% gas. And this expands to twice the volume the following day. And we can see here that the hemorrhage has now been displaced inferiorly. Day seven, there's continued movement of the subretinal hemorrhage. A fluorescent angiogram was then performed and the ICG showed us the polyps which were suspected to be the cause of the submacular bleed. And at this stage, uh, it was some years ago, she had a vastin and settled uh, well following this. Let's move on now to vitrectomy surgery. And Jean Dewan and Robert Mackema um, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s proposed vitrectomy with very large retinectomies, plus or minus uh, full uh, translocation surgery for these sorts of cases. Uh, then um, our Japanese colleagues explored subvitrectomy and subretinal TPA and explored heavy liquid to massage blood through a draining retinotomy. Um, Yusuke Oshima also started to describe a peripheral uh, retinectomy to drain blood. But these surgeries are major surgeries and have significant potential complications such as detachment, PVR, which is a dreaded complication, macular holes and membranes that can form over the macula. This is a 52 year old uh, Thai female who presented with a vitreous hemorrhage and her referring retinal specialist thought she may have had a retinal detachment. As you can see here, it's a little elevated there was no significant previous ocular history. She underwent uh, 
vitrectomy and drainage. This is the uh, setup with uh, 23 uh, vitrectomy. Once we're inside the eye, the small amount of breakthrough blood is removed. And we can see here a hemorrhage and likely polyps in this region, which cause the bleed. The um, elevation bisected the macula, it split the macula. So um, here we're attempting to uh, drain it. So we're using heavy liquid to uh, displace the blood away from uh, the macula. And as the blood moves into the periphery displaced by the heavy liquid, endodiathermy is used to create a small retinotomy through which the blood is able to be uh, removed. So some of the blood was able to, um, that is the liquefied part was able to come out and then I also here used a retinal cryotherapy probe with external massage to try to shift the rest of the blood out through that small retinotomy. Here, most of the blood was able to be removed and uh, the advantage of heavy liquid is that the blood uh, was uh, um, displaced uh, on the surface of it and exited out of the other um, sclerostomy ports. So at the conclusion of the case, um, heavy liquid was kept inside the eye. And then five days later, the patient was taken back to the operating room to remove the heavy liquid. We can see there's some um, macrophagic response on the back of the um, crystalline lens. The heavy liquid is able to be uh, removed. The retina is uh, well attached. The retinotomy is sealed. And this patient recovered um, quite a lot of sight. Day seven uh, after uh, surgery, the gas bubble uh, is uh, going and she did quite well. This is another patient who's 62 years, he's Chinese. And at this stage, an ICG showed a extrafovial polyp and discussions were uh, took place as to whether this should be treated or treated with uh, thermal laser or PDT. And my colleague at that stage decided to treat it with um, laser. Um, and we can see here the uh, photo immediately after the treatment. Uh, there was closure of uh, the uh, polyp uh, and it was successful and vision uh, was stable at six over 60. Um, he then unfortunately um, presented um, uh, with a recurrence and this was treated with PDT and following the recurrence, he sustained a massive subretinal hemorrhage as you can see here. It covers virtually all of the posterior poles and even um, extending into the uh, equator. Uh, he then came under my care and I treated him uh, with a pneumatic displacement using C3F8 gas. And a week after the gas injection, his condition continued to deteriorate. He described a shadow coming over his uh, vision. Visual acuity fell to hand movements only with a diffuse hemorrhage. And this is the B-scan ultrasound showing a subretinal clot here and breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage. We managed him conservatively at that time, anticipating the poor prognosis and that the vitreous hemorrhage might resolve on its own. Unfortunately, he continued to deteriorate and he has now a massive subretinal hemorrhage. And having discussed uh, the options with him and his family, we elected to drain the blood. So this is his uh, surgery, um, very dramatic, large, large um, subretinal uh, hemorrhages. Been there for a little while. And here I'm using uh, heavy liquid, again, in an attempt to um, displace some of the blood, at least from the uh, macular uh, region.
And then um, a peripheral uh, retinotomy uh, is made. Um, I use a cutter uh, for this and was able to remove some of the blood, but not all. And he ultimately did poorly and the eye became dicycle. So risk of massive hemorrhage after uh, PDT uh, does occur. It has been uh, reported both in the Japanese and also in the uh, Hong Kong group. Um, it's one of the um, risks that I do discuss uh, with patients now if I choose to treat them uh, with PDT. So in conclusion, subretinal bleeds causes uh, devastating vision loss. In my practice, uh, intravitreal gas injection uh, to pneumatically displace the blood is the first line. Vitrectomy is really now used in very selected cases. Heavy liquid is useful as an adjunct. Um, peripheral iridotomy, if one wants to drain the blood um, peripherally, and often there is also um, some exudative detachment that requires drainage as well. And um, as touched on, uh, these patients still need uh, ongoing treatment with our anti-VEGF uh, therapy. Thank you very much.